Okay, you might want to leave. This is the same talk. <laughs> Next up, what am I going to cover? If this looks like stuff that you already know, you also may wish to leave because otherwise you just to get to deal with my sense of humor for the next hour. And I'm pretty sure Jason Scott's sense of humor is a better one, and he's in the next room talking about podcasts. Um, if you know what ISO is, if you know what aperture is, if you know what shutter speed is, if you understand what the term focal length means, if you know how to use a flash, or you know how to frame a subject, that you will learn nothing from this experience, and you will leave a hollow shell wondering what this talk was about. On the other hand, if you'd like to hear me yammer about these, here we go. Okay, camera basics. Last year I had a number of bullet points. This time I have a block diagram. <laughs> um, this is to get you on the same page so you understand what your camera is actually doing underneath all of that beautiful shiny metal and plastic that you point at, you look at the back of the screen and go click. Um, the environment has light being emitted off of it. Better statement, reflected off of it somehow. That light is going through free space, or air as the case may be, into the front of a lens, which then focuses it onto an imaging plane. That would be the thing on the left side. As I gesture to the left, and you guys know that's the left. Stage left side. Um, this is important. Understanding what's going on here will make the rest of this particular talk a lot easier. Um, I will be coming back to this diagram. Next up, ISO. How many have heard of the dreaded term ISO? How many understand exactly what it's telling you? Yeah, OK, great. We have the right audience, excellent. ISO is a measurement of how sensitive an imaging surface, be it film, be it digital, be it CMOS, be it TTL, be it some magical device not yet invented, how sensitive it is to light. You double the ISO number, you get double the sensitivity off of the surface. Downside, in modern, unmodern, old, new, this is probably a law of physics, I just don't know which one it is. You make something more sensitive to light, it also gets more noise. So the final effect of that is, as you make a sensor, a sensor that's extremely sensitive, it's also extremely noisy to the point where you can't actually see anything in it. We'll get to that. ISO is not, however, a measurement of noise. Keep that in mind. If ISO were a measurement of noise, you could sit there and actually tell how noisy a camera was based off of its ISO number. Can't. You can be pretty certain that ISO 200 on this camera, which is what I've been wandering around and blinding roomfuls of people all at once, all con, um, you can be reasonably sure that 200 is more noisy than 100. That's pretty consistent. I'm sure some laws of physics have to be broken to make it that, make it other than that. ISO 400 on camera B, you can be pretty sure is more noisy than ISO 200 on camera B. But yeah, really don't know how noisy ISO 400 on camera B versus ISO 100 on camera A or vice versa. My camera on 400 will look better than just about any consumer grade $200 camera on anything. Set it at 50, doesn't matter. Mine on 400 will probably look better. So key thing to keep in mind, ISO is the sensitivity, not noise. Higher sensitivity, high, higher noise, but comparing camera to camera, you can't tell anything. Direct comparison. And once again, it's very hard to see due to the fact that we're blowing this through an LCD projector whose primary job is to smooth out an image and make it more difficult to see the nasty jaggies that are in it. But the point of this is, on the left side, I have 100 on my camera. On the right side, I have 3,200. And OK, you don't see the difference in the whites. You do see the difference in the green, where you'll see these little specks of noise popping up. I don't have anything red in that photo, but there's a red speck there. This gets really bad at higher and is entirely imaging sensor dependent. Hmm? Is there, is there an official noise? Number? No. So 
uh, so the recording got this. The question is, is there an official noise number? No. Have never found one that actually shows up and gives me a metric that I can measure. Yes? However, as you go up in ISO and it looks worse in some ways, it looks better in other ways. Yes, occasionally you can actually see the subject. Um, that's usually a big thing that most people want to see. So increased ISO is useful. And uh, it, there are certain situations where increased ISO is entirely upside. Um, and you don't care about the noise. Often, if you have a high enough resolution and you're willing to downscale the image in post-processing, which I'll mumble about later, uh, a higher ISO doesn't matter because the noise is being averaged out over a number of pixels. If you're crazy like me and end up having to actually use the raw image sensor resolution, um, a higher ISO is a killer. It turns an otherwise beautiful image into crap. Um, 99% of the time, you want to use the lowest ISO setting you can for the environment that you're shooting the photos in. 99% of the time. I'm sure there's 1% of the time. That's not true. It happens. But I can't give you rules of thumb unless I'm willing to be general about those sorts of things. Typically, on your digital camera, ISO is going to land somewhere between 100 and 400 for automatic. If you want to take it outside of that range, you will probably have to grab some switch on your camera and tell it to go higher. If you're on a film camera, well, the ISO is whatever the ISO of the film you loaded is. Um, that can range dramatically. OK. Next evil topic, which you've probably all heard of and sat there and scratched your head at some point. Aperture. There is an iris that sits on that block diagram that controls how much light gets through the lens. This allows you to control, at some level, the exposure. But more importantly, it ends up controlling the depth of field, which now makes me dive off in the left direction and explain what depth of field is. When you focus a camera on a subject, you're focusing on a given point away from the camera. It's a distance. That is the point where everything is in focus. There's an acceptable range on either side of that. So we're not going to declare this to be the line, cameras over here. You focused on po this point. There's an acceptable point where stuff is in focus around that range. Since you have that acceptable point in focus around that range, stuff sort of near the focus point looks OK. Depth of field is how wide that range is, and can vary greatly. Uh, demo photos of that. It's called the f-stop as well. It's called the f-stop because it's a fractional value. Um, I don't understand the history of how it got set up this way. I didn't get into photography until far too late in the game. And Taking pictures is more interesting to me right now than learning the history of why it got set up this way. So if you ask me why it's set up this way, I'm going to have to stand there and say, I have no idea. Useful things to know. It's the denominator of a fractional value. So an f1 lens says all the light gets through. An f1.8 lens means 1 over 1.8 of the light gets through. Um, 3.5, 1 over 1.35, or excuse me, 1 over 3.5. This means as the f-stop goes up, less light is getting through. The effect of this, though, since less light is getting through, the depth of field gets wider. OK, so this is my um, example target from last year. This is not actually a depth of field demonstration. This is just so you know what the next two pictures are actually of, because otherwise you sit there and go, What's the rusty bar? I set my camera on the front of this tractor and looked up at its steering column. And I sat there and ran the f-stop around. This is a photo off that camera at f3.5. In the background, it's fuzzy. In the foreground, it's really fuzzy. The one point in focus is the top of the steering column. That's it, f22. The entire thing gets sharper at both the background and the foreground. 
there's a much wider range over which you can see what's in focus. No, the, the, the aperture is a setting which would normally live as part of your lens. It, though there are some camera designs where the aperture is not. Aperture is a setting that exists on all cameras. The one example that I can come up with where it might not exist would be cell phone cameras. I'm going to disbelieve that they exist and move on. <laughs> so if I just flip back and forth, you can see the difference in what the aperture setting is doing. What I haven't got to, which I'm getting to, is this affected the other settings I had to make. OK. So jargon, because every field is full, filled with jargon. And due to working in the computer industry too long, I seem to pick it up without thinking about it. But it helps to sometimes actually say what it is. When you have a lower minimum f-stop, you describe the lens as faster than one with a higher minimum f-stop. An f1.8 lens, which is f minimum f-stop is f1.8, is faster than a lens that is a minimum f-stop of 3.5. This, is, this sort of terminology ends up happening a lot, particularly because film that has a higher ISO value, which you remember it makes it more sensitive to light, is described as faster than film with a lower ISO value. You have to know what they're talking about when you hear the term faster, because it doesn't actually, because it means something slightly different in each context of what people are talking about. Um, so you saw the de varying depth of field effect on the last two slides. Now I'm going to show you how you can use that to your advantage if you know it's going to happen. That's a rose. You can't see what's behind it because I wanted to draw your eye directly to the rose itself. Since I have very explicitly told the camera to use a very low f-stop, the background got blurred out. Note, I was about this far away from it when I was shooting the picture. So the background gets blurred out because it's focusing very close. The depth of field was about that wide. Physically, depth of field, this was the only acceptable focus range. And the background was about that far away. Blurred out, you end up with a picture like that. If you look here, you can see it's actually already getting fuzzy at that point. That's how narrow the depth of field was for that photo. Hmm? Just keep terminology in place. You're saying you're using lower f stop to keep it close. Lower f stop uh, is just a matter of, in the arbitrary sense of, yes, it's a low f stop. The, the, number. the number is lower. This means that more light is getting through. Okay. Just making sure that the jargon of the terminology. Yes, it is really bizarre. And it doesn't necessarily make any sense. And I would have not built the terminology this way. But photography is now an old field. And you have to deal with the terminology as is. OK, last major knob to twist on your camera, shutter speed. Yep, does exactly what it tells you. This is how long your shutter is open. This is how long light has to get to your imaging surface. It is typically described, except when going for extremely long exposures, as a fractional value, once again, in seconds. So a shutter speed is usually described as 1 60th of a second or one five hundredth of a second. Um, I pick out one sixtieth because it's a very useful number. It's really about as fast as, or hmm, careful, it's about as slow of a shutter speed as you want to have if you're hand shooting photos. Typically, cameras won't go much below one thirtieth on automatic. Okay, so short shutter speeds can create stop motion images. We can freeze reality for a mere moment and take a picture of it. And since every manual on the planet regarding photography does this, here's mine. <laughs> Fountains are this wonderful thing that you can stop motion of, and they blur out beautifully, and yeah, yeah. The one on the left, long exposure, where long was roughly a quarter second. The one on the right, one five hundredth of a second. You can get it to blur out. 
you can use this to your advantage if that's the effect you're going for. On the other hand, this is how you get the wobbly blurs of photos that sometimes show up when you're running with automatic and it decides, um, hmm, not enough light. Let's do a quarter second exposure. And all you see is blur. If you know it's going to happen, that's one thing. If you don't know it's going to happen, it's going to make your life unpleasant and you're going to end up with hundreds of photos that you don't want. <laughs> this was my story of Nauticon last year. I ran around without a flash taking photos. Of the 400 I shot, I think I got a dozen. Um, we're going to get to that too. <laughs> That's the scary part. You're absolutely right. <laughs> okay, settings are a balance. You can exchange one of these settings for the other. Stare given a particular lit environment that you're trying to take a picture of, and you figure out these settings work, the exposure is right, we get enough light in, but not too much, mind you, and it falls right in the middle of what my film can handle, you can sit there and swap it around and change the settings for that environment. Um, this is an example. These two settings will give a equivalent exposure, which is the amount of light that actually hits the surface. It'll look about the same. However, the first one is a reasonably long exposure, so if you're trying to get a picture of a car whipping by you at 60 miles an hour, it's not going to look very nice. But if, if it's still, and the object that you're shooting a picture of isn't moving, you'll probably be fine, and it will be more clear because it has a lower ISO number, less noise in the image. The other one will do a better job stopping the motion of whatever it is you're looking at, but it will have more noise. Same thing here, ISO 100 both times, but you can move up and down and f-stop. Okay, I'm going to jump back to f-stop for just a moment. The f-stop is a fractional stop value, which is designed so that you can move up or down one and double or divide one of the other values by, or divide one of the other values by two. So. These were set up, the fractional values are arbitrary numbers that happen to make that work for the aperture. At some point, you just memorize them and work with it. But we're in the modern age, the best part is you don't have to. Your camera already knows, which makes it a lot easier at this point. So yes, f3.5 and f4.5 are in fact a doubling. So, okay, I have to look at this again because I don't recall how I built this slide. Yes, F3.5 is actually double the light getting through to the image sensor as F4.5. That's where they are. Works. I don't ask. Okay. Now, this is where we enter the modern age and make it so that we don't have to think about this as hard anymore. Every camera that you can buy today, short of exotic hardware. So you walk down the aisles at Best Buy, and you look at the cameras they sell you. They have a light meter in them. The light meter has the ability to look and monitor the light entering the lens, figure out how much is there, and take a stab at how it should be set up for the various three settings that I just threw at you. These are remarkably good. The trick is whether they're doing what you want them to for your environment. So typically, the way a light meter will set up, it'll look at the light coming in and try and give you the best aperture opening, which means the most light coming through the lens, at the, OK, back up. It will set it up so that it will let the most light through the lens, which means you can run the shortest shutter speed possible. Because a lot of people, like me, shake. And holding a quarter second exposure still handheld is somewhat challenging. Uh, I, I honestly don't know anyone who can do it. I can sort of do it when I have enough caffeine in my system. But here's where it gets fun. Most of your cameras have a knob which will let you exchange aperture for shutter speed and change that ratio, which allows you to adjust your depth of field and your shutter speed. 
Most cameras have a second knob somewhere on them that will allow you to say, okay, I want you to intentionally make this exposure worse, or wrong choice of words. I want you to intentionally make this underexposed or overexposed. And thus, you can say, overexpose this and give me a wide open aperture, which will give you an overblown image with a very short depth of field. Or you can grab the knob and twist it the other way and say, underexpose this image intentionally, make the aperture really small, and thus make the exposure very long, which is awful handy if you're trying to photograph, for example, stars which I assure you are a challenge, particularly through normal lens. Okay. Key point. There is more than one way to monitor and analyze the light coming through the lens. You can meter the light at the point your camera chooses to focus on. You can meter the light across the entire image. You can meter the light inside a little circle in the middle of the image. These are common modes. You need to check the manual for your camera to understand how it meters light. I can't tell you I don't know your camera. Seriously, check your manual. This is useful information and it lets you change and understand what it's seeing. If you ever get horribly overblown photos, it's partially the lighting environment, but often because the camera thought the room was darker than you did, based on its understanding of what you were pointing the camera at. Okay. Digital cameras. Zoom. How many of you know how much zoom your camera can do? In. Okay, cool. What does that mean? Well, I'm not even worried about that. What's zoom mean? Right, right. But can you actually quantify for me what exactly the difference between a 3x and a 4x zoom is? What's the difference in the optical elements? How does the image change? Bingo. That's what I was going for. Zoom is an interesting term that's come about recently because not everybody is shooting pictures on the same imaging si sensor. I don't have a slide for this, so I'm just going to have to talk about it. Um, <laughs> So focal length is the interesting number that we're going after. And that comes up to how you do optical zoom. Optical zoom, in the normal sense, is an adjustment of the focal length of the lens to the imaging sensor. This results in a smaller angle of exposure from the light entering the lens. So this is my block diagram that I promised you all that would be coming back. It will probably come back to haunt me later. The first is, we're going to declare that 1x. The second is 1.5x. The point of this is the lens has moved further to what you would see as your right. The lens moves further to the right. That means there's a longer focal length. This means the angle of light that's entering the lens becomes smaller. Or smaller. That's what zoom is. Rephrase. That's what focal length changes. Now, how big is the imaging sensor? Long time ago in a land far, far away, time that's almost past us, everybody shot 35 millimeter film. You worked in the 35 millimeter realm. You knew that your imaging surface was the frame of the 35 millimeter film. So focal length was an interesting number. Now the imaging sensor can be as big as that. It can technically be bigger, but that's rare. But often it's smaller, and often it's much smaller. A focal length and an imaging sensor size interact. When everybody had the same imaging sensor size, you could just talk about a focal length, and it would make sense, and you would have an idea of how wide or how narrow that angle of light entering would be. Everybody's sensor sizes changed, so a focal length by itself doesn't tell you anything. Thus we are re reduced to, my camera does 4x zoom. Grand! What's the angle of entry of the 
image coming in at that point. That strikes me as being more useful than 4x, because I never quite can tell, is that mean you can narrow the angle to four times as narrow as your widest point? Uh, can you, does this just mean you have no really wide angle? Does this mean you have only narrow angles and can go really narrow? Zoom is a horrible number which tells you nothing about how the camera can actually view. Angle, that would be a useful number. I don't see that published very often. Okay, so back to my slide. Optical zoom. You slide the lens forward and backwards. Sometimes it can do this inside the camera itself. Sometimes, um, example, this camera, it actually slides elements in and out. What this ends up doing, like I said, narrower field. Then you might have heard of this horrible thing called digital zoom. The elements don't move. The camera takes a subset of the imaging sensor, says, I'm going to take this section, my imaging sensor is this big, I'm going to take this section and in software scale it up. There's no, this isn't higher resolution pixels, I'm sorry, the same number here as there would be if I was capturing all of them. So you're capturing this much and blowing it up. Limited number of pixels there and now we're making them and interpolating and guessing harder. Almost consistently, digital zoom is a horrible mistake unless you are going to do zero editing on your photos. If you will never ever edit your photos and you're just going to take them off your camera and put them on your Sony television that can read memory sticks or something like that, okay, digital zoom might make sense. But if you are willing to do any level of post-processing, digital zoom will only make your life bad. Don't use it. Shut it off. Most cameras have a knob which says no digital zoom. Solves it. Okay. Flash photography. Or how I've been blinding people all day. <laughs> Essentially, it's a light source that we synchronize with the opening of the shutter. This brings up an interesting term, which is minimum sync speed on your camera. For flash photography to work, we have to set off a light, very bright, during the precise moment that the shutter is open on the camera. When the shutter is open all the way, because we have one burst of light to work with, you set it off. Most cameras can do very, very fast shutter speeds. Mine goes down to one two thousandth of a second. However, it does this by having the opening shutter trail down and the closing shutter trail after it. So what happens is there's a very narrow slit that's actually open during any given time. Problem is the flash fires instantly during this slit somewhere. So what you would end up with was a band of actually lit section across the photo and the other parts are unlit. So what happens is there's a minimum speed for flash sync, which my camera, one two hundredth of a second. That seems to be pretty common. What this means is the distance, okay, now I have the entire frame open, I can fire the flash. Now I close it. That's the fastest um, shutter speed you can run when doing flash photography. Here's the great news. Most cameras won't let you set it in a state where it won't work right. Thus, you don't have to worry about it much. But if you're wondering why your camera with the flash open won't go over one two hundredth of a second, or one hundredth, one one hundredth of a second, or some other arbitrary number, when you take the flash off, it goes to a much faster shutter speed. That's why. Okay, flashes typically have a very hot color temperature, which makes them look blue. Pictures taken with flashes will look bluer than pictures taken with natural incandescent light or natural light. And I am not going to talk about color temperature for the simple reason that this dives into a deep, dark corner of how we represent color, human perception, and other scary things that make me crawl into the corner and scream in agony. <laughs> I have spent hours of my life trying to get my monitor color accurate. I gave up. I don't have the hardware to do it, and I don't have the patience to do it. 
So it matters. It's very interesting. Yes, sir. Have you tried tungsten film? Excuse me? Have you tried tungsten film? No, because my cameras don't feed film. It makes it very difficult to swap out the imaging element on my digital cameras. I would love to do that. It would be really cool. I don't shoot film at this point, mostly due to cost. Okay. If you are deeply interested in dealing with photography and understanding the physics and the metrics and how this works, I highly recommend a study about color temperature. I think everybody's head would explode. Mine usually does when I go into that detail. So I'm just going to skip it and move on. Okay. Tends to wash out an image, whereas that is to say that all of a sudden something that looked like it had depth, it had fields, it had all, you could see the shapes. All of a sudden, it looks like somebody hit, a, hit them with a steamroller. This um, results in a lot of people going, wow, it looks so much better when I was there, when staring at their photos. OK, first piece of advice. Just don't use your flash. Turn it off. Don't let it work. It will make you happier. OK, so you don't have a choice. You've decided for whatever reason that you're going to use flash because the room is dark. Yes, this example here, this room is dark. You don't notice it. Your eyes are incredible tools. They are capable of understanding things and doing things with lighting environments that I can only hope to replicate in a camera someday. Um, I've been shooting flash all day. I've been shooting flash all day because it's dark in here. And I want to actually have photos at the end of this particular event. Low light, you use the flash. You're going to get a picture. It'll be better than a blank frame or a blurred mass. OK. Next situation, you want to see the detail in a subject. And you don't really care if it was an accurate reflection of what you were seeing in the room at the time. Often, when I'm working on circuit boards and I want to get a picture of the circuit board so that other people can see what, point or what part I'm pointing at and saying, look, I think this one blew up. I'll go use the flash. I'm not worried about whether it's an accurate reflection of what my workbench was looking like at that moment. I want people to be able to read the serial number off the chip. Um, social cue. Surprisingly and shockingly to me, Using the flash as a social cue has been more helpful in more situations than I can count. People can't tell when you've taken a picture, particularly with modern cameras, which have an electronic shutter, so there's no actual click. So it's just, and you walk away, and people go, did you take a picture? They don't know. A flash firing is a universal signal that somebody took a picture. It works. I, if it works, accept it, I'll use it. Makes life easier for me. If you're going to use flash photography, experiment with it. Understand what your flash is going to do. Understand how your flash is going to work. I, realizing that I was here and I was, my task here is not a con, I got handed this was, take photos of the event because we never have enough after it's over. So I went down the road of actually investing in an external flash, which is this large contraption that's been already strapped to the large camera. Um, it is a grand improvement over the flash that is in my camera. It has made all the difference today and will make all the difference tomorrow. If you're going to use flash photography, get an external flash and learn how to use it for indirect lighting. OK, I post a lot of photos online. Some of my friends even look at them and comment on them. It's sort of fun. It's amusing. People occasionally ask me, how did I get that photo? There is one question I have to ask everybody in this room. Where is your camera right now? OK, I have two people who actually indicate that they have their cameras with them. OK, three, three. Missed one. Sorry, sir, you're being covered by the light. I, I can't see a thing that you're doing back there. OK. The first rule of getting a photo is having a camera. <laughs> Dead serious. 
if you don't have a camera, you aren't going to get the picture. And frankly, the best thing I've ever come up with for getting pictures was having my camera in the car with me when the picture happened. You run across good photos all the time. If you wander around with the mindset that, yeah, I can take a photo of this, what would be good? And you look at it and you go, that's a great photo. And you go pick up your camera and you go take the photo right there. If your camera is five minutes away, that picture's gone. If your camera is sitting in a bag in your home, half an hour away, 45 minutes through traffic, there's no picture. There's no chance of getting that picture. And, and the follow-ups are, did you download the photos and clear your memory card? Are you out of space on your memory card? Is your battery charged and ready to go? The best thing I've come up with is leaving the camera, or learning to carry the camera with you everywhere. For me, well, the thing's big, heavy, obnoxious, so I forced myself to carry it every day for a year and a half. Now, I know where my camera is, I know what state it's in, I know it can work, and when a picture happens, I go take the picture because I have it all there. The startup time for going and getting your camera doesn't work unless you're doing studio photography. And so far, I don't have many willing victims to stand in a studio and let me take pictures of them. Don't know why. Okay, next stage. Bits are cheap. Use lots. <laughs> They're fully recyclable. Um, the point of this is so many people fail to use the fact that we're on, oh, okay, back up. This is digital only. So many people fail to utilize the fact that if you take a bad picture, there's a button marked delete. So taking another picture is almost a zero cost event. I've seen people wander in with a digital camera to go get a picture of item X, walk up, take one picture of it, and walk away. And come back an hour later, walk up, take another picture of it, and walk away because the first one didn't work for them. Bits are cheap. They're free. They're fully recyclable. You can go get more. They're easy. Right off the bat, go in, shoot photos. Lots of photos. Walk around whatever you're taking a picture of. Get another shot of it. You might find a corner of it you hadn't missed. Um, if you're running a digital camera, look at the display. Huh, that photo sucked. <laughs> go get another shot, do it again. Repeat ad nauseum until you are so tired of it or the police are called because you're loitering. Just go! <laughs> the worst case scenario is you'll have to delete a lot of photos. Best case scenario is you get two or three good ones out of the deal. Post-processing filter later. Big deal. Okay, so I, I'm quickly approaching the end of my talk, which means I'm either going extremely fast or extremely slow because I... oh. Okay, I have gone through 40 minutes of my talk so far. This is shockingly timed accurately. Totally shocked. This is a photo I took about 18 months ago, and I got a lot of comments on it, and a lot of people liked it. Your opinions may vary. I sure hope they do, because if you all have the same opinion, I'm in deep trouble, and I have not sufficiently drank enough Kool-Aid. Um, people ask how I got that picture. This picture is from my drive home at night. I go buy a picture that looks like this about two days a month. The trick is, my camera was in my car that day. It was sitting in the passenger seat. It had a lens on it. It was ready to go. I pulled over to the side of the road and started taking pictures. This was one of them I got. But I also got all of those. There are a lot of pictures there, and I think it scrolled off the side of the screen on me. I shot over 25 pictures to pull that one out. And if you look through them, I'm using exposure bracketing. So the first picture on the left is horribly overexposed. The next picture is what it's considered zero. The next one is underexposed. I moved six foot and I did it again. Parked at the side of the road for 10 minutes. And you go through afterwards and you find the ones that work. And what I ended up with was that one. But it didn't look like that when I was taking the picture. The eye has a much wider dynamic range. I was actually seeing the field stretched out before me. 
can't see it in the photo because the dynamic range of the camera doesn't allow it. What was pointed out was, wow, that sky is really beautiful, but what's all with all the black space underneath? And I said, well, that was the picture I shot. But you have a point, cropping it would make it better. So that's where I ended up with. This is how you do it. It's a lot of time, a lot of luck. And OK, I'm an amateur. My only qualification for talking about this is the fact that I've been running around with a camera for three years shooting photos and occasionally getting one that looks really good. My hit rate on good photos is about one out of 30. You shoot 30 photos, one of them you'll like. Accept it, acknowledge it, move on. Shoot a lot of photos to make up for it. OK, that's the end of my talk. I'm now up to the open questions. If you have any, shoot. I will either tell you I don't know, make up answers, or give you something useful. Go for it. Uh, I know, but maybe not everybody else in the room knows. Dynamic range. Ah, sorry. What did I say about that? I, I work in the tech field. I pick up jargon without trying. Um, dynamic range is a way of indicating how much you can capture of bright versus dark. So if you can understand that, I'm going to start throwing arbitrary numbers at this because it's easier for me to describe it this way. If whatever your capturing device can understand that something is brightness level 6, 7, or 8, if you, the thing that you're trying to capture is actually brightness levels 3 through 10, you're only going to get a very tiny section in there of the total range of brightness of the image. So everything down here is going to be dark. And everything up here is going to be horribly bright. It's going to be white. And you'll just get that little section in the middle. The eye has a very wide dynamic range. Film has a wide dynamic range. Digital cameras have a narrower one, and you have to work around that failure. And that's how I got to the, I saw a field at the bottom of that. I could see it. Camera can't. Smaller dynamic range. That's another difference between the ISO rating of film versus the ISO rating of digital. They both are captured. OK, the statement was that's the difference between the ISO rating of film and the ISO rating of digital. My understanding of ISO, which I admit and acknowledge, my only qualification is I've been running around with a camera. The ISO rating is an indication of how sensitive it is to light. This doesn't talk about dynamic range directly. There's a side channel of information stuffed in there that indicates, yes, low ISO film tends to have a wider dynamic range. But it's not the immediate number that's being discussed. Lots of little things fall on the side. And they just get tacked onto the same meeting because they made sense at the time, and the technology moves out from underneath of it. And we're stuck with jargon that doesn't make any sense. Welcome to the tech field. Yes, sir? How much manipulation do you find yourself doing with uh, Photoshop? Essentially zero. I, I made a promise to myself a long time ago that my goal was not to manipulate photos into being the image that I wanted them to be, and rather to try and make the photo as close to what I wanted it to be in the first place. What I do with software, the limit of what I go up against is cropping. I typically don't even crop. I have an automated chunk of software I've written which loads my photos, resizes them, tilts them appropriately. So my camera has this neat trick, which has a rotation sensor. It knows which way is up, records that inside the image, and my rotation software reads that and turns the appropriate side up, scales it. And I stop there 90% of the time. Gentleman in the green shirt in the back. Uh, I like wide angle photos. Mm -hmm. So, what would be the best way to do that? Like a wide angle lens or just the crop? Are you trying to capture? OK, wide angle photos. Best way to do it? Wide angle lens. Here's the bad news if you are running with digital SLRs, Almost all of them use smaller sized image sensors, which results in the famous for K 
Canon series cameras, 1.6 multiplier for focal length. What this means is getting wide angle shots on digital SLRs is hard because you need things like 10 millimeter lenses, which are considered fisheye, and other strange things happen. If you're willing to do photo stitching, do photo stitching and stitch multiple photos together. Oh, they, make them. They, just, they, just they exist. Be prepared to shell out lots of money for it. If you're going after a landscape and you're willing to do photo stitching, I would go down the photo stitching line. If you really want the wide angle stuff, yep, you need to go get a wide angle lens. If you're running on a DSL, uh, DSLR, it's going to be an expensive lens because of the multiplier effect, or it's going to be an expensive body. Um, if you're going with snapshot cameras, I don't know of any that go really wide, but I know plenty that go reasonably wide. The, somebody else had a I don't own a tripod. Occasionally I use one because I can get somebody else to hand me one. They don't work out for me in the end because a tripod staples you down to a specific spot and a specific thing. One of the few times I use tripods is when I'm taking apart a chunk of electronics and I actually want a stable shot as I tear something apart. So I'll set up my camera on a tripod mount pointed down into my workbench peel off the first layer or something, take the photo. Peel off another layer, take the photo. It's a tear down one step at a time. That's one use of the tripod for me. If I'm doing big landscapes and I have to do the photo stitching thing, yeah, that'd be another time I'd use a tripod. Almost entirely otherwise, I run handheld. You mentioned Kazar. Did you manage to do stars with the other tripod? Yes. Turn the ISO all the way up. Turn the exposure all the way down. Pull it out of the noise in post-processing. That's one of the hard ways to do it. Yeah, it'd be a lot better if I actually... Thank you, technology. <laughs> My laptop is bored with this talk. It's decided to go to sleep on me. I apologize. <laughs> um, yes, I've done STARS handheld. It's not easy. There are, well, I mean, there are some things that there are some things where there's just not enough light to work around and there's fireworks, fireworks handheld actually has worked for me pretty well you, 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 your mileage may vary your hardware may vary unfortunately I usually don't get to do firework pictures because I'm busy shooting them as opposed to actually shooting photos of them but that's <laughs> a different hobby and not a subject to this talk okay anybody else The first thing you want to learn to use in whatever your photo processing software is, is the histogram display and the ability to either tighten or widen the dynamic range of the photo of what you captured. I am not a Photoshop guy. I am not a GIMP guy. I don't know that much about it. My understanding is there is a talk coming up in the next day or so which will probably do a significant better job covering that than I ever could. Yeah. Excellent. I've just been informed it's 2 p.m. tomorrow. What room? In here. It, okay, 2 p.m. tomorrow here is where you can learn about Photoshop for beginners, is my understanding of the talk. Anything else before I... Uh, Do you do any macro? No. Why not? I don't have a lens. <laughs> the closest thing you get to macro that I do is that rose picture I had earlier. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I should really get one. It'd be really handy for working on the small parts. Haven't done it yet. Okay, actually then, because even, if, even though I've done video work, I never did it. Define macro. Macro is the ability to focus on an object that is very close to the lens. This requires typically a different lens to do because the focusing elements work differently when you're working in the near field of an object. 
yeah, different flashes, different lighting, and it's an entirely different game from when a subject is this far away from me, or as you're far away from me, when the subject's this far away from me. Because that's how macro works. You can focus on things that are this close to the lens. I've just been informed I have five minutes left to bore you. So. <laughs> See jargon overloaded. Next. <laughs> Anything else? Did you guys just find this helpful? Okay, cool. Then I have succeeded in my goal. I'm going to give up now. Thanks, guys. <laughs>